in the million dollar view, which is only a six mile long byway in uh, southern Arusta County over near Danforth. They're just spectacular view shit. Well, the million dollar view has been called that for decades. Uh, when are we going to adjust for inflation? Well, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> we have, uh, my current line is we don't have any money, so we're not going right. to adjust anything. <laughs> Here we go. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. There's a chill in the air and the first hints of color are tinting the leaves. It's just about fall foliage season, something we kind of take for granted. So there may be some things you don't know. For instance, do you know that Maine has a dedicated fall foliage website and a fall foliage coordinator? We'll talk to her in a few minutes. You can even get automatic fall foliage updates by email. Do you know how many official state scenic byways there are? and how to find them and how to use them. You will know by the time this show ends. Maine is the most forested state in the Union, so yes, we do have the best fall foliage, and it means big bucks to our economy. We'll meet a few of those bucks later in the show. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by Hammond Lumber Company, Old Town Trading Post, Dysarts, EBS, and Napa Auto Parts. But first... A week ago, there was a dramatic rescue at sea. A whale was tangled in fishing gear just south of Acadia National Park. While the story did make the paper, there's a lot more to it. So, I called up Zach Cliver last week. He's chief naturalist for Bar Harbor Whale Watch. The company operates the biggest, fastest whale watch boats in North America. They take tens of thousands of people out to see whales every summer, and sometimes they get a little more interactive. So what happened, Zach? Well, yesterday when we got out to Mount Desert Rock on a whale watching trip, we found a humpback whale two miles north of the island that was really heavily entangled in fixed fishing gear. It looks like a mix of gill net gear and lobster gear. There were a bunch of buoys trailing the whale. It's not completely clear uh, all the mix of gear, but the whale was tethered to the bottom and really did not move during the two and a half hours that we stayed nearby. Uh, we did call uh, the NOAA uh, disentanglement team and uh, they put the coordinated in the effort with the Maine Department of Marine, Marine Resources to come out yesterday afternoon and they were successful in cutting away a lot of the gear uh, around the head. It was wrapped around the mouth and the, and the pectoral flippers. Uh, they ran out of time um, b b uh, later as, as the sun was setting, and they, they fixed some uh, buoys to it to help uh, support the whale and keep the, the um, line up off the bottom so that the whale wasn't carrying so much weight of the, of the trap and the gear or whatever was down below. And they also put um, on a, um, a uh, telemetry buoy so they could track it in case it moved. And they went back out this morning. They found the whale had not moved. It was still uh, in place, and they're on site right now um, working to cut away the remainder of the line around the tail stock. Wow. Now, is this the case where the whale just got entangled in something, and then the more it struggled and the more it uh, wandered around the ocean with attachments, it picked up more gear? Yeah, it very well could be that that's exactly what happened, especially if it ran into a net of some kind where there was uh, a lot of gear stretched out over a, you know, a couple hundred feet. It could have wound up pulling that through lobster line and then got more entangled. But it was really pretty entangled and uh, had a couple of cuts on its back. It definitely um, uh, was under a lot of stress with all that gear. Um, we did see that same whale the day before, and we were uh, fortunate we got some nice pictures of the dorsal Bin, which we sent down to the Provincetown Center for Coastal Studies, and there's a woman there, um, her name is Dr. Juke Robbins, and she's got an extensive catalog of humpback whale dorsal fins, and she was able to match that whale just with the dorsal fin and find out it was a young whale named Spinnaker, who we saw the day before for the first time this summer, and is about 11 years old. I think I've been out with you uh, once before on the whale watch and actually saw a spinnaker for myself a couple of years back. Is that possible? 
Oh yeah, Spinnaker was here a lot in, re in uh, just a few years ago and hasn't been here so much, but Spinnaker was part of a big group of teenage humpback whales we had here, which we called the Punk Humps. <laughs> <laughs> very clever. <laughs> yeah, they were a wild group, you know, very uh, active and jumping and stuff. So it's, uh, and it's interesting, part of that group was this other whale named Hang Glide, who also got entangled this spring up at Graham and Ann Banks, and that's a whale on June 9th that we found, and the Canadian rescue team went out the next day and successfully saved that whale. Well, how do you free a whale? Are you have some a, a serrated knife on a large pole, or how does it, you cut stuff away? Yeah, exactly. They have a whole suite of tools, and they do have some large poles with uh, specially fashioned knives. A lot of them are kind of curved with a pointed tip so they can kind of reach in and grab the, what, what line might be there and, and cut, you know, get on it and then cut it at the same time. Um, they, they also have a, discovered that they can use this, uh, arrow that's specially designed for hunting, uh, fowl like turkeys. It's a, called the guillotine gobbler. And it's, it's a blade that's like a cross that spins through the air. And they can fire that at the wheel when the line is really tight against the body. And if, and if the arrow hits that with these sharp blades, it will cut the line and pop the line right off the wheel. And so uh, it is dangerous work. They, have, they wear helmets. They are very cautious. Um, people have been hurt. You know, doing this kind of work, it's not something you can take lightly. It's a big animal, and if they're panicked, they might react by, you know, slapping their tail or lashing out and, and hurt someone not intentionally but can. Well, I would think they would panic. Isn't that the natural thing uh, an animal would do, which is already in a stress situation? Yeah, you would think, um, and, it, and certainly some species are more prone to that. My understanding is the right whales are especially difficult. They are... Uh, they don't favor having people in boats near them very, you know, with, and not being in control of their own faculties. So they can be a very uh, energetic and very challenging whale to, to, to um, disentangle. They often they have to wait for the whale to really become more lethargic and kind of, you know, become uh, tired and um, run down before they're able to really do, you know, to do a lot around them sometimes. But the humpback whales, um, they found, uh, it seems, they, if they get entangled, they kind of almost enter a state sometimes that's more torpid where they uh, are still and they're not moving. They're kind of uh, resigned to just being still, you know, they, if they're really entangled. And um, I think... It's interesting, my wife has a horse, and, and the horse got ex very tangled up in barbed wire. That horse stood ex absolutely still and let her cut all that away. And I think maybe the humpback has the same conscious, you know, kind of awareness, self-awareness, that it just will stay, it sometimes can stay put and maybe is in a little bit of shock and will um, work with people. But it doesn't mean that you can't, you can t you can't take it uh, for granted. Well, I would uh, think that if you're out there with a the whale for a long time and you've got uh, other concerns, like a bunch of passengers on the boat wondering when they're going to go home, how do you handle that? You know, <laughs> it, is, it definitely is an issue. Um, we, we were pushed a bit yesterday because we had some cruise ship people on that needed to get back <laughs> at a certain time. And, uh, you know, uh, it depends on the, on the, on the crowd and, and how it all plays out. Um, we found with that entanglement back in, in June, we had a lot of families on the boat, and I was on the I was on the top of the boat narrating, and I had group after group come, you know, purposefully go up to the top of the boat and say, "Hey, we just want you to know we want to stay until this whale gets rescued. We'll stay, we'll stay, you know, as long as you need to. We're gonna work here for this, you know." So. Uh, you know, uh, it really depends upon the group, I think, and, and how it plays out. Um, but, you know, we, we have to be conscious of that. So it always is better for us if we do find the whale anchored a bit to the bottom because then we can, if we do need to leave, we have a better um, 
uh, hope that it will be recovered. You know, the whales that we find that are pulling loose line through the water that's really, they're really wrapped up in it, and we're following if, if they sometimes um, they get away from us, and, and that doesn't always um, have a happy ending. How many whale encounters do you have uh, on average every year where a whale needs to be freed from entanglement? You know, it would be interesting for us to go back and look um, through our records, but um, some years we have quite a few. I can think of some years where I've known of five or six um, that we've played a part in. Um, other years it's just, uh, you know, one or two, but it's, it's pretty normal for us to have some uh, encounters with uh, whales that are entangled. You know, I'm very happy this year that the, the ones that we have found um, uh, have, ha, it seems like it's turning out well. One of the things that would be great for people that are interested in this or work on the water is to go to the NOAA disentanglement um, a large whale disentanglement uh, network. Um, you can go online and look this up, and it has information about what is appropriate and not to do. And really calling them and letting them coordinate that rescue is the number one thing. You need to. You, you don't want to be doing that yourself. You could. You could really get hurt. So oh, we need to yeah. call the experts. Don't worry. There's no chance in hell I'm going to do that by myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if next summer you're out there and uh, Spinnaker shows up uh, all fat and happy, uh, are you going to pa- pop some champagne? Yeah, I think we will. <laughs> That's Zach Cliver, Chief Naturalist for Bar Harbor Whale Watch. You'll be happy to know that the whale named Spinnaker was relocated by the rescue team and was completely disentangled. He's now roaming free somewhere out there in the Gulf of Maine. Up next, you might think you know everything about fall foliage in Maine. We'll see. We'll talk directly with the State of Maine's Fall Foliage Coordinator next as Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine continues on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Somewhere up in the St. John River Valley, the leaves are starting to turn colors. Those colors will march southward for the next month, hitting peak in a rolling wave down the state. That creates a significant boost for the Maine tourism economy. And let's face it, families have been driving around to look at foliage ever since the Model T. There is a State of Maine Fall Foliage Coordinator. Her name is Gail Ross. And that really is your title, Gail? That's correct. And for the most part, the Fall Foliage spokesperson for the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. That must look pretty good on a resume. Right. Um, It it, it does look good on a resume. And uh, if the fun part of the job. Well, I'm, when I first look at that, I'm thinking, what does this person do? Go out to the trees and say, okay, everybody turn red on three? Right. Yeah, really. Uh, what this person does is collect the information from our forest rangers within the main forest service. We have uh, our zone map is divided up into seven zones, and we have a district ranger report their weekly observations in each of the seven zones throughout the fall foliage reporting season, uh, uh, something that they have been doing since 1959. Um, so really the Maine Forest Service took the lead on reporting foliage conditions, which we all know is a huge uh, tourism destination um, this time of year. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that fascinated me is that you've divided up into seven uh, foliage zones um, usually when you see maps of Maine divided up, they go by tourism regions, and they don't always match up to the activities on the ground, so it's actually enlightening to see the, uh, the fall foliage maps actually correspond to where the foliage is. That's right, and uh, once we get into the season, if, if a person were looking at the map, we saw split zones 3, 4, and 5 from north to south because color progresses from north to south. So, for an example, in... Zone 4, which includes Holton and Millinocket, they could be uh, reaching peak conditions while the southern part of Zone 4 might just be showing moderate to high uh, leaf color. We do do the soft split for those zones. Well, how much difference is there between the peak season in Fort Kent and, let's say, Kittery? How, much, uh, how many weeks difference? 
Generally, generally you will find uh, peak conditions up in Fort Kent the last week of September going into the first week of October. And Kittery, you may not see peak conditions to after Columbus Day weekend into that following week. But generally, by the end of October, uh, all of the zones have either reached peak or are definitely going past peak at that time. When I think of uh, conditions that... Uh trend towards eastern Maine, let's say Acadia National Park, it always seems to be Columbus Day weekend. So it how generally is, it's yeah. generally it's Columbus Day weekend and probably a week beyond because uh, it's, you know, it's a little bit warmer on the coast in the fall than it is inland. They may not have had their uh, killing frost. They, the growing season may still be in effect. Um and that, you know, just because the coastal zones seem to have warmer temps in the fall, it prolongs their foliage reaching peak. Yeah. Is there much variation from year to year about when that peak happens, uh, or is it usually within two or three days at the same time every year? It could be within a week's time. Um, generally, it's pretty much on track with what we report if you had a warm summer little, with very little rain, warm nights, it tends to um, be a week behind. But then you can get a few frosty nights in September or early October, and it, it, it just seems to, the weather seems to allow it to catch up. Well, I've been looking at the Department of uh, Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry's website, and it looks like you have ramped up. Your website we for have. fall foliage. Yeah, tell me about it. Well, we have. We've, we've definitely made it much easier for folks to navigate. Uh, there's, a, there's a block where they can sign up to, to uh, receive the fall foliage reports by email. Uh, we, we have, for the last couple of years, had a Facebook page, and we also have a Twitter page. So it just... It, 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 it makes it an easier navigational tool for people. It also it includes a lot more things of when and where to visit, any events that take place during the fall foliage season, but both through the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry, and the Office of Tourism. And uh, it, it just, it's, it's able to um, give our visitors a lot more tools to plan their trip. One thing else uh, new on the website as well is that you can now submit photos. Uh, yes. Does that happen a lot? Yes, uh, it does. Um, one of the nice things about uh, getting information from the forest rangers is they also can they also submit photos to us from the different zones. And while they may not be perfect photos, they do give you an idea of the progression of the foliage to match up with the report. Mm -hmm. But we do really, we really, really encourage our visitors to the website, which is mainfoliage.com, to submit their photos, find their favorite photos. One of the things we're going to do this year, too, is also put in a um, uh, Throwback Thursday photo. So, <laughs> so we're going to grab some photos from the archives <laughs> to uh, throw a uh, photo from years past up. And uh, so we, we really do have a lot of uh, past fall foliage photos that we were, you know, there were just too many to use, so we always had to pick, pick one. But this year we'll be able to um, go back and throw some photos on that maybe we weren't able to do back through the years because we've been doing this since 1995 when we launched the foliage website. Yeah, if you go back too far in time, they're all black and white, and that won't help. <laughs> no, that won't help. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. My guest is Gail Ross. She's the official fall foliage coordinator for the state of Maine. If it weren't for leaf peeping, Maine's tourism season would shut down about Labor Day. Instead, we get a big boost through Columbus Day. Getting the most bang for our economy involves a bunch of different departments and organizations, which we'll go into in a moment on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket.
This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. We've got about two weeks before the fall colors start to hit peak up in the north and a little more before dazzling colors take over our area in eastern Maine. Nature coordinates the colors. The Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry coordinates the tourists. That's actually the job of Gail Ross. So how do you do it, Gail? You know, people really enjoy coming to the state of Maine. I think it's because they want to get it with the weather. And uh, a lot of people like to visit our, our state parks. And in the fall, we're, we're going to be offering some heights throughout some of our state parks, which there will be, there'll be more to come on that as soon as we get that piece finalized. And people absolutely enjoy coming to Arcadia and Baxter State Park in the fall. Now, do you have a favorite place yourself for leaf peeping? My favorite place, I believe, is probably the western mountains of Maine. Mm-hmm. And if you can catch the western mountains of Maine at peak, it's absolutely breathtaking. Now, on the, uh, on the Maine Foliage website, there's a contact page and an email address that's uh, mainefoliage at uh, maine.gov. Yes. Who, who gets that email? Is it you or somebody else? M- me, yes. Yeah. <laughs> do you get many emails? I do, I do. People like to contact me to plan their trip, or they really want to know when to come to Maine to catch peak conditions in certain parts of the state. And I, I believe our visitors just really enjoy that, that interaction with uh, talking to a live person. Mm-hmm. Well, the foliage website itself is uh, embedded in the department's website, and so your web address yes. for the foliage page is about as long as my arm. Yeah, it, it is, it's simply if you just type in mainfoliage.com. Oh, that'll come there? Yes. Oh, all right. Even though the when you're looking at the URL, it does seem quite lengthy, but it is. It's the official website is <laughs> mainfoliage.com. Well, that's much easier. Okay. Now, Definitely. Which state parks would you say have the best foliage? I'm going to guess Camden Hills is pretty good. Well, Camden Hills, but you know, Aroostook State Park. As the season, as the colors start progressing, Aroostook is a great state park. A lot of people go up to Quaggy Joe. Um, Camden is beautiful. Uh, over in um, the Rangeley region, people enjoy going over to the, the, the state park in Rangeley and going to the height of the land. I, I think all of our state parks really are a nice foliage destination. Well, with any luck, we'll get people out to go leaf peeping and enjoy everything that Maine has to offer this season. And so far, the weather has been, I think, pretty conducive to a good fall foliage season. It definitely has. Um, I know people have been phoning in because they're seeing a little spot of color here and there, and that's generally because a tree, we did get an abundant amount of rain. And, you know, our summer and spring were a little cooler, so which helped set us up for a really good foliage season. Mm-hmm. And what people may be seeing is a tree that may have been a little distressed. I noticed on my travel into the office, so typically the same trees every yeah. year that start the progression of color. You know, for the most part, I think we just leave that up to Mother Nature. <laughs> <laughs> well, Gail Ross, thank you for joining me on Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. Thank you so much for having me. There are many partners who help Maine's economy cash in on fall foliage. Certainly the Maine Office of Tourism plays a big role. So does the Maine Department of Transportation. That's where Fred Michoud coordinates the state's scenic byways. Good morning, Fred. Good morning, Bob. Well, uh, this is your second time on. I wish there were a prize for that, but there isn't. (laughs) I want to talk about fall foliage. Obviously, foliage happens at different times in different places in Maine, but we've got 10 scenic byways, three national scenic byways, and uh, one all-American road in the state, so there's got to be some fun to be had somewhere. Well, and and since the foliage changes typically north to south, uh, our further uh, northernmost Byway is the St. John Valley Cultural Byway, which just finished celebrating the World Acadian Congress, a two-week event up there with uh, 120 family reunions. But it's a ride through the St. John Valley and the Fish River Scenic Byway, and if you want to catch early foliage, I would suggest at the end of the month that those be the two that you target. It's an absolutely gorgeous drive across the state at the northern part. Yeah, the foliage starts in July. Well, it sort of does. I, I keep denying that. I think it's a water shortage to the trees, but I've been corrected a couple times. Yeah. 
So all of, of all your scenic byways, which one is the best for fall foliage? Boy, that, that that's hence they're all scenic. I mean, yeah. uh, in Western Maine, you have Rangeley, uh, the you know the uh, in the uh, Rangeley Lake scenic byway. The drive up Old Canada Road through Skowhegan up through to Jackman and the border is also very pretty. In and around Moosehead. All of them have magnificent vistas. Even the Million Dollar View, which is only a six-mile-long byway in uh, southern Aroostook County over near Danforth, they're just spectacular view sheds. And so any one of them offer quite a uh, a nice tour. Uh, connecting a few together even makes for a greater tour, but they're all rather scenic. Well, the Million Dollar View has been called that for decades. Uh, when are we going to adjust for inflation? Well, our... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, we have, uh, my current line is we don't have any money, so we're not going to adjust right. anything. <laughs> okay. Um, well, which one would you say is the least fall color? And uh, I'm going to jump on that and say Bold Coast because it's mostly spruce fir. You're probably right, and but it's uh, it, it, it's got the clean, fresh fall air, so I guess it compensates for the loss of foliage. And uh, uh, you know, it's a preference, whether you want the coast, uh, if you're riding a motorcycle, uh, you know, if you want a windy, twisty road, go up through Mexico to Oquasic, uh, or you go up Route 11 on the uh, Katahdin Woods and Waters Scenic Byway, or if you just want to do touring for foliage, uh, my favorite probably is the long views of uh, the area in Rangeley. Uh, the St. John Valley is my personal favorite. Of course, it may have to do more with my heritage. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I think they're, they all offer something, and... Uh, there are places to stay, there's good food and uh, lodging along the way, there's uh, a lot to see in many, many of these areas. Well, I was just on the Bull Coast uh, Scenic Byway um, a couple of days ago, and of course it's just lovely. Right. Uh, so that really is world class in my opinion. But when, when you come up the height of land over by Rangeley, now yes. is, is there anything that can possibly beat that during foliage season? There are a couple of people that want to try to, but I think that that's the hands down most spectacular view in, uh, in the state on a scenic byway. Yeah. Now, there are no scenic byways in York, Cumberland, Sagadahawk, Knox, Androscoggin, and Kennebec. Isn't our end of the state just prettier? Well, I'm biased. I'm from uh, <laughs> East Millinocket originally, so I definitely have a bias north of a certain line. Yeah. Uh, but it, 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 it lends itself more to an undeveloped characteristic of the landscape as opposed to the built environment that you see in southern Maine. And not that southern Maine doesn't offer things, but the access to the coast is more limited. Uh, there, there doesn't have the geological features that, say, you would find in northern Maine, particularly Katad and Moosehead and all. So I think that it's the underspoiled component of Maine, more rural areas that really lend themselves to the scenic quality. Now, do scenic byways get paved more often? No. Uh, <laughs> there's there's sort of a disconnect of, there, huh? Well, it's sort of like a byways, you know, in name only. Uh, they're high-quality visitor experiences in terms of they offer uh, extraordinary scenery or cultural historical particularly like the St. John Valley it's historical and cultural uh, could be recreational such as in the Katahdin area uh, could be archaeological so they offer these but they're, they're different from the, a similar road somewhere else because those other roads don't offer those components so it's a it's a comparative thing so the 14 that we have are really unique drive experiences compared to other roads that uh, we have throughout the system. How many of our scenic byways actually have interpretive signs and pullouts to describe some of the culture and history in those uh, areas? Uh, Old Canada Road is well signed, yeah. the Rangeley Lakes is, and uh, just in time for the World Acadian Congress, uh, the DOT installed 28 panels um, along that byway all the way from Hamelin and Sear Plantation to Allagash, mm -hmm. and uh, it tells the whole... Uh, one one uh, observer said if you went and visited every one of the byway interpretive panels there, you would come away with at least better than a passing knowledge of the history of the St. John Valley. Yeah. So it's very educational, but they're very entertaining. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. My guest is Fred Michu, who coordinates the Scenic Byways program for the state of Maine. We do have one all-American road in the state. I presume you know where that is. If not, you're about to find out as Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine continues on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. I'm Bob Duchesne, host of Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, and Fred Michu is my guest. He coordinates the Maine Scenic Byways program. We do have one federally designated All-American Road in the state, and that, of course, is Acadia National Park. 
So, Fred, is an all-American road somehow more special than a main scenic byway? Yes. Uh, we have three categories. We have an all-American road, which is Acadia, and we have three other nationally designated byways, which uh, of which Acadia is one, too. But uh, we have uh, Old Canada Road, Scudic, and Ranger Lakes uh, uh, as the national. They have a unique attribute of having a value or one of those intrinsic values I mentioned, scenery, history, culture, that just propels them to another league that, it, they become more nationally important compared to all other roads. There's only 150 national byways. And of that class, only 30 of them share that distinction of All-American Road with Acadia. Acadia has multiple values to be shown, so it's not just scenery. It's all of the elements. And as anybody who's been to Acadia knows, it's, it's just a, 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 you know, it's like the Bonanza. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's got... It's got recreational, it's got scenery, it's got the history and the culture, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's all there. Um, so it, it is another league of its own, and it has international appeal, not only national. It's internationally recognized. If you're in California, for, even though that's still part of the U.S., but uh, if you're yeah. in California and you say Acadia, you only need to use the one word and people know automatically where it is. It's no different than saying Big Sur to somebody from the East Coast. Yeah. I would say uh, going up Cadillac in fall foliage season is probably as good as height of land because the whole mountainside is aflame. Right. You know, and uh, being a main, Mainer from the in, uh, from, uh, interior Maine, I don't know. I think we were brought to avoid the coast sometimes, although it is <laughs> a spectacular. See, I, would, uh, I agree with you. It's totally beautiful down there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the coastal byways, as you point out, a lot of it's spruce fir, but the, the fact is is that there's just great vistas and it's the ocean. It's just that fall feeling anywhere. Well, people forget that Cadillac Mountain, I think, is the highest point of land right along the coast along the entire eastern seaboard down to South America. It is. Yeah. It isn't very often you see a mountain, a mountain you know, right, in the, right abutting the ocean. I mm-hmm. mean, um, Is there any chance we could extend the All-American Road through Southwest Harbor so maybe they'll stop tearing it up this summer? <laughs> One doesn't necessarily correlate oh, to the other. Uh, you know, and there's always talk about expansion, and one of the things is we, we, we intuitively feel that these create uh, destinations for people to come because people want to go to someplace pretty. They don't want to have to spend a lot of time exploring it. So there's the idea that it's a named byway gives people the feeling that maybe somebody did some research up front to give, give it that name, therefore it must be worth going to. Mm-hmm. And I... and. We, we fight hard to not create, you know, just a meaningless name of a byway. And even with extensions, as you mentioned, Southwest Harbor, uh, it would be up to the town, for example. If they wanted to extend that, they would have to approach the department. And, you know, there's a possibility, but it has to be evaluated. And whether it's, but So there's a process, but it's, uh, we try to give the value, uh, the value to those roads that really deserve it. Is, uh, they're unique and distinct on Maine's landscape. Yeah. How many byways are um, bicycle friendly? Well, that's that's uh, that, I don't have a good number for you there. Uh, I don't think there's any one of them that's perfectly bicycle friendly. Uh, there are places where we have limited shoulders, or narrow shoulders, or no shoulders. Uh, then there's others where they're eight foot shoulders. So it's it's all over the place. Um, in bicycle traffic is becoming a, uh, a a more used mode of getting to and from destinations. You know, people like that way of travel. In fact, we're doing Bike Maine right now, where people are trekking around for a week on bicycles. You know, doing a thousand miles in Maine, and and that's just an example of how we've seen the emergence of bicycles. Um, and so I I think the use is up, but we have a ways to go before we have quality shoulders on the full length of these byways. Well, it's always going to be a work in progress no matter what. So. It is. I think you're right that the awareness is building and more people are biking, because I see it a lot more now. Well, we're working on a new sign uh, here even. For example, there's a three-foot separation distance for vehicles to uh, for pedestrians uh, and bicycles from vehicles. Mm-hmm. And so we're working on a concept where we can put these signs uh, along um, routes where there is shared use, where uh, driver awareness is going to be critical. It's, you know, people just sometimes they forget that that road is being used by bicyclists. And if you get up into the Smyrna area, we even have, you know, an Amish community. So there's a whole different set of uses up there. Yeah. So, yeah, it's kind of a – we want to make sure that if anybody wants to go, regardless of how they go, that they're safe doing it. So yeah. we work hard at that. Do you ever worry that timber harvesting is going to affect a stretch of a scenic byway? 
Uh, <laughs> you know, that's an interesting question. Uh, it, it probably wouldn't help it get its designation, the byway, for being a, having a natural component, although it's a natural event. But, yeah, so, in other words, natural means undespoiled in, in its natural state. Yeah. But, um, also a realist, too, is that some of the best vistas I've ever seen are over a clear cut. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are mountains that have emerged in my lifetime because the trees disappeared. <laughs> Uh, it, well, and it's true, and it we is. all know that. <laughs> I know. Um, it, it's because even though, on the one hand, it does it makes something sometimes look rather trashed out. It, it, it when it comes back green and it grows back and it's in well, it's growing. It just gives you these incredible views, and so. It's a mixed blessing, isn't it? It really is. I think it's one of those things that uh, we have a love-hate relationship with in this state, so it's kind of funny to think about. What advice would you give to folks looking for uh, foliage on scenic byways, like when, where, how do you plan? Well, I think that it's important to, to use the state's uh, foliage um, website, which is run uh, uh, annually. But uh, people can check to see when peak foliage might occur and then plan accordingly. And uh, like I said, the foliage travels north to south or west to east. Uh, and uh, you can, there's a byway in all of those regions in which one accommodates your time schedule, and, and uh, you just may want to pick it that, based on that. Now, you, know? you have your own website for byways, too. Uh, we do. At Explore Maine, mm -hmm. you can get information. From Explore Maine, uh, just Google Explore Maine. That's a DOT function. It'll take you right there. It'll t it'll give you not only byway information. It'll uh, give you access to our bicycle routes that we have uh, designated as, uh, you know, uh, let me say, not scenic, but it, it, nice bicycle routes for uh, bicycle enthusiasts who help put the uh, map together. And so you have some good information for for recreational uses on the Explore Maine website. Yeah, that Explore Maine is dot org or dot com. Explore Maine is dot org. www explore maine one word yeah. dot org. Uh, Maine Office of Tourism is tracking usage uh, to websites, and what they're finding is that scenic byways tend to be right up in the top two or three uh, active sites that people are looking at, and I because touring is one of our chief. Uh, Attractions. People like to just drive in rural Maine. So scenic byways, as I pointed out before, are something that people look at readily because there's an inherent belief that these are the valued places that Maine has chosen to put people on for good experiences. Yeah. And I think that that's borne out by the numbers. Statistically, the byways rank really high in terms of um, hits on the, webs on the websites. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, once again, the website is exploremain.org, and you can get all the information about scenic byways. That's great. Uh, that's Fred Michu of the Maine Department of Transportation. We talked about the Million Dollar View, a scenic byway in a remote corner of the state that makes people say, wow. How would you like to live on it or even operate a terrific lodge overlooking all that scenery? If there was any doubt about the impact of foliage on Maine's rural economy, the doubt will be erased as we head to Weston next on Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. You're listening to Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, and it gets pretty wild along Route 1 between Callis and Holton. There are famous fishing lakes and excellent hunting. And there is one section of road with the vista so famous that it's called the Million Dollar View. First Settlers Lodge sits above that view. Stephen and Susan Mine welcome guests year-round. And right now, Stephen is my guest. Thank you, Bob. Glad and to be here. I hope you and Susan are well. It's been uh, over a year, I think, since I've visited, so I'm way overdue. Well, we are well, and we're doing well. The business is doing well. Had a great summer, and looking forward to the fall season here. Well, I'm trying to think of any innkeeper in Maine who has a better fall foliage view. Uh, Blair Hill and Greenville might come close, but I think you're number one. Well, we do. We have a really nice uh, landscape view out in front of us. Uh, we have a view out towards Mount Katahdin. Uh, that's it's probably about 53 miles away uh, from the lodge, and we have this beautiful... Uh, view of the valley laid out in front of us there. Yeah, in fact, it is so beautiful that the state of Maine put a scenic byway not only through the area, but a, a rest stop right across the road uh, with signs indicating the view. That's correct. Who came first, you or the, or the stop? Uh, actually, the uh, owner before us actually gave them the uh, right-of-way there to put that scenic uh, 
lookout out because it's on their property. And uh, since then, the uh, state um, has also put in some nice uh, storyboards over there. There's five of them that kind of talk about the area, you know, what Indians were native to the area, about a canoe carry that was in the area, and, you know, just about the animals and one about the mountain range that you can mm-hmm. see from that turnout. Certainly the point is that your view is so good, the state stole it. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy to lend it to yeah, them. Right, there you go. <laughs> um, do you actually have guests who stay for the fall foliage alone? Oh, yeah, they come up uh, leaf peeping for sure. Mm-hmm. It's part of our business as well as, uh, obviously, the uh, bird season is a big season for us up here as well. Yeah, there's an awful lot of good bird hunting in the area. And, and besides that, you've got East Grand Lake right behind you, so there must be a certain number of fishermen who come stay. Yep. Uh, during this period of time in September when the lake flips, we do get a lot of people that come in to uh, fish all the way up till the end of September. And then, obviously, in the winter, we get a lot of ice fishermen that like to come in and snowmobile down to the lake and ice fish there, too. On top of everything else, you've got a great kitchen, and uh, most of the dining room tables, I think, face out big picture windows so you can dine while watching the foliage. That's correct. (laughs) Absolutely. We have, uh, actually, every room in the lodge has a beautiful view. You're actually a long way from a big supermarket. How do you keep your kitchen stocked? (laughs) Well, we actually... uh, our food service is out of Bangor, the Dennis uh, oh, Paper yeah. Products, mm-hmm. and they come in a couple times a week and supply us, uh, you know, the basics and the big stuff. We'll go and get our fresh produce and fruits and that kind of stuff in Holton mm. at the supermarkets up there, which, like you say, they're almost an hour away, 50 minutes away. Yeah, the, the funny thing about First Settlers Lodge is it's both right on Route 1 and also off the beaten track. You can't say that very much about Route 1 in Maine. No, that's correct. Once you uh, get north of Callis, it does become uh, a little bit more rural. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're in a very scenic and rural area here, and people love to uh, you know stop in this area for the views. I mean, they're just absolutely phenomenal. And there's a nice hiking uh, trail um, up to the top of a little peak in this area called Peekaboo Mountain, and there's a fire tower up there. And you can get a 360-degree view from there as well, and it's a really beautiful thing to do on a fall day. And that fire tower was restored by the local ATV club uh, for people to go up and and see that. So, Well, well, First Settlers Lodge is right above East Grand Lake, uh, where it's, of course, known for fishing. You've got snowmobile trails and cross-country ski trails uh, available to you. So is peak foliage season the end of your busy season or the start of it? (laughs) Well, it's the end of the fall season. We do get a respite uh, typically from Thanksgiving to Christmas, and then the snowmobile season kicks in uh, early part of January. And because the trail goes right behind the lodge here, easy access, we do have a lot of snowmobilers that do come in the winter as well as ice fishermen. Mm -hmm. All right. On top of everything else, um, I was pleased and surprised to find out you actually have conference and banquet facilities. Um, we do. And we have a, a large meeting room downstairs, and uh, we get quite a few uh, organizations that will come in. And usually, uh, you know, 40 people or so. Um, you know, the IFW has met here, and, uh, you know, those kind of organizations will meet here periodically. Mm-hmm. On top of everything else, you have a range of bedding facilities. I know you've got at least a luxury suite and an efficiency apartment. and I forget how many bedrooms you have. Well, seven rooms total, the apartment included, Mm -hmm. um, and that's rented out uh, more on a long-term basis, and that's uh, the lower level of the lodge. And then we have uh, one room that uh, I guess you probably call it the luxury suite or honeymoon suite that uh, looks out above the fields and the gardens in the back. And then we have uh, four rooms on the main level um, that are all very nice rooms, and like I said before, they all have beautiful views. Well, we've now carried on about a six-minute conversation without actually saying exactly where you are. So okay. we should really <laughs> yeah, disclose well, we're, that. We're on Route 1, uh, just north of Danforth, uh, about two miles north of Danforth. Um, easy access off of 95 is through Lincoln onto uh, Route 6 and then across to uh, Route 169. And uh, it's about an hour outside of Lincoln. And you're just over the border into Aroostook County, aren't you? 
That's correct. Okay. We're the southernmost town in Weston, Maine, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Rooster County. So we're the first town coming across the border. So for anyone who wants to get a jump start on leaf peeping, the leaves will turn color further north. When do you usually hit peak? Um, it's between the 1st of October and the middle of October. All right. And it's First Settlers Lodge. And what's your website? Uh, FirstSettlersLodge.com. And uh, on there you can uh, find lots of information as well as a video showing all the rooms and accommodations that are here as well. And as you stated, Bob, my wife's a great cook, and uh, people come here and really enjoy having her uh, food here. So that's another reason to come. Well, give Susan my best. And once again, thanks for joining me on Bob Duchesne's Wild Bean. Uh, nice to be there, Bob. Thank you. That's Stephen Mine. He and Susan operate First Settlers Lodge in Weston. If you know a better fall foliage view than theirs, email me. The station email address and a rerun of this program is on our website at 929theticket.com. This show and all previous shows are downloadable right there. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine is brought to you by Ham and Lumber, Old Town Trading Post, Dice Arts, EBS, and Napa Auto Parts. Join me Saturday morning at 9 a.m. on Sports Radio 929 The Ticket.